bonded by common themes and indecipherable t-shirts, rock and horror have been bedfellows for over half a century, with the heavy metal horror movie the wonky offspring of a union so genetically limited it's virtually incest. Are you serious? Even so, there are plenty, or at least some, great examples of this subgenre. Japan's Wild Zero is the perfect showcase for the thundering theatrical madness of Guitar Wolf, while Trick or Treat's a horror masterpiece despite Ozzy Osbourne. Gonna drive my long steel missile down on your love channel. And if we open the doors wide enough, this church can claim one of the most popular cult movies ever made in the Rocky Horror Picture Show. One of you guys know how to Madison? But I won't be talking about any of those because this video is about the best worst heavy metal horror movies ever made and all that entails Drugs, witchcraft, cursed music, Dracula, Dracula, Pirates, Greyhound, Death and Destruction, Coldplay. Are you nuts? There's another man! Betty Mancuda! Drop in love! I tried to have rules, but it didn't work. It turns out you can't talk about the best worst heavy metal horror movies without talking about movies that may not be heavy metal. Or horror. Or even movies, actually. Which brings me straight to number 10. Daikonyama Wonderland Horror follows three young students at a Japanese talent school whose entirely non-threatening headmaster sends them off to walk about in the dark as part of their training, which they seem quite excited about to begin with. Are you ready? They soon encounter a punk band hiding out in an old dark house, and before we know it, Girl Wands History. <laughs> It isn't long before Girl 2 is attacked by Japanese Jason, so after stumbling on and kidnapping a random baby, she runs off into the night. An exhilarating chase ensues, and by the time it's joined by Freddy Krueger for some reason, the tension's at breaking point. But it turns out the baby was the real threat all along. <laughs> By this point, Girl 3 is looking worried, and when it starts raining body parts, she seeks help from this, which points her to a nearby circus troupe who give her a rifle. That's good, because a gang of Beetlejuices are after her now, but only for a while, because the movie ends when they're distracted by someone else, which proves a bit of a limp conclusion. One of those low-budget Japanese V-Cinema releases, Daikonyama Wonderland Horror runs to just 45 minutes, and half of that's padding and B-roll. But, for a few short scenes, Teriyoshi Ishii's movies, as weird and wonderful as they come, a dreamlike exercise in free association made even more surreal by its poor picture and a lack of subtitles, which at least means I can make up the dialogue. <laughs> Satanic curses are a popular plot device in these movies, with at least half a dozen revolving around a piece of music written by or with the aid of a demon. Sometimes that curse extends to a location, and occasionally it's a result of a musician selling their soul. But the only movie I know that manages to do all three is Paganini Horror. There's some terrible curse that's out to kill us, one by one. And all this, all this comes from the music. And from Paganini too. Right. It's about a bunch of 80s rockers who awaken the spirit of late violin virtuoso Niccolo Paganini when they rip off a concerto he wrote with the ultimate metalhead. Today in this house, a contract has been stipulated between Niccolo Paganini and the devil, wherein the musician is granted eternal fame in exchange for his soul. Signed, Paganini and Satan. It was written and directed by Luigi Cozzi and produced by Lucio Fulci confederate Fabrizio De Angelis, which on paper looks like a fine pairing, but the two couldn't agree on tone, theme or mythology. So, like most of Cozzi's movies, it ends up a confused and messy compromise. And now, the new scientists, through their enormous radio telescopes, have discovered that the old theories were right. Stars, in their revolutions, make really their own sounds. 
Donald Pleasance is drafted in to do some expositional tidying up at the end, but he only makes things worse. We're still reeling from the discovery that Paganini's ghost was apparently also a vampire when Loomis reveals there's a haunted house story taking place on a level unrelated to the haunted music. Not for the last time in this video, my advice is forget the plot and focus on the dubbing. We can use the title Paganini Horror. It's going to be fantastic, sensational. I can see it. People are going to love the music. No one has ever done anything remotely like it before. Except for Michael Jackson with Thriller and his fantastic video clip. We could do the same! Number 8 offers more convincing 80s metal than Paganini Horror, and fortunately for us, has even greater trouble depicting reality. <laughs> Blood Tracks, a pre-credit sequence shows as an abusive husband being killed by his wife, with she and the remaining family escaping into the mountains, and as voiceover man helpfully informs us, For the next 40 years, the family hid out, in the middle of nowhere. Now, intruders are on their way. Those intruders are rock band Solid Gold, who want to shoot their new video in a factory. But with America famously devoid of factories below the snow line, they're forced to follow a rumour up the mountain and eventually find one at sea level somehow. Avalanche has cut everybody off, and as the cast wanders about alternately panicking, rutting and looking for each other, the now feral cannibal family begin killing them. It's a Swedish production and clearly filmed in Sweden. I don't think I've ever seen a Volvo used to scale the Rocky Mountains, with the band played by members of Easy Action, a local metal act led by guitarist Key Marcello. I'm coming to get you. Who shortly after filming left to join Scandi soft rock keyboard pokers Europe. Allegedly, the band hated the shoot and spent it drunk, presumably alongside the unconvincing groupies. You want to go listen to the avalanches? Are you nuts? I don't think anyone up this mountain is going to be interested in the avalanches. It isn't your classic good-bad horror movie, it's more of a weirdly likeable idiosyncrasy, in some ways comically primitive, but in others quite impressive. Certainly few movies have conjured such a palpable sense of genuine cold, possibly because the cast really were freezing. Hey, how come you didn't tell us how cold it was going to be? Yeah, I'm gonna freeze my tits off! Who told you snow was warm, baby? Number 7 offers a respite from the cold because it's the inexplicably warm and chirpy Slumber Party Massacre 2. I'll keep this brief because I've talked about it before and it's about as metal as Xanadu. But the killer uses a drill neck guitar to murder the members of a band, so you'd better believe it's appearing on this list. It's party time, please. Like all the Slumber Party Massacre movies, part two was written and directed by a woman, in this case Deborah Brock. And that perspective does seem to lend the franchise an unusual feel. In quality terms, it's all over the place, the first movie being quite clever and this one not. But in both, the female victims are shown a little more respect than they might have been, though they still don't get a say in what happens to them. It's Sunday's my birthday and I don't want to go to a mental hospital. Slumber Party Massacre 2 is unusually bright and colourful, but in this genre, footage shot on murky video is almost as common as Iron Maiden posters on the bedroom walls of 35-year-old teenagers, and most of the early examples in particular were shot on VHS. In fact, movies like Terror on Tour and Bloderan still aren't available on any other format. Our next movie is, and it was shot on film, but because it was edited on tape, it still looks like crap. <laughs> Like Paganini Horror, Shock'em Dead revolves around a Faustian pact, this time between talentless plank spanker Angel Martin and a voodoo queen who hangs around a pizza shop. And it's all the result of David Lee Froth refusing to hire him. How'd you get to be so bad? How many hours of non-practice did it take? Come on, Johnny. I have made better sounds sitting on the pot! Endowed with voodoo powers and played in close-up by then-nitro guitarist Michelangelo Battio, Angel fulfills his dream of joining the garage band that rejected him and assaulting Tracy Lords. But unfortunately, his new life isn't plain sailing because he didn't read the small print, and it transpires he needs to do regular murders to maintain his abilities. None of that seems to slow his meteoric rise to stardom, though. I haven't seen anyone like him since, uh, 
Uh, what's his name? Bit that bat's head off. Hmm, what was his name? Yeah. The taste of bats is very salty. I know not everyone appreciates Shock 'em Dead, but I love it. There's an inadvertent trauma like quality to everything, especially the performance of Stephen Quadros as Angel, who plays it straight but comes off like Melvin Junko from The Toxic Avenger. Um, hi. I'm here for the audition. He went on to become an MMA commentator, and as a rumor, he knocked out Joe Rogan in a Las Vegas toilet. It all makes for a weird vibe where everything's a little off, and it's never really clear what's meant to be a joke. Comic books? That's for fags. Keep the change. Like all tales of Faustian consequence, Shock'em Dead degenerates into a morality lesson, which could be don't make a deal with a voodoo queen hanging about a pizza shop, or could be beware the rhythm guitarist with a hypodermic full of coconut flavoured concentrated food, because that's the bewildering means by which Angel's destroyed. For number five, we need to return to Europe and Spain's Carpathian Mountains, but it's well worth the journey. Our Mystery Incorporated stand-ins this time are the members of real-life Spanish punk band The Killer Barbies, who break down near a spooky castle and decide to accept the hospitality of its spooky residents. But this is a Jess Franco movie, so that proves a bad idea. The head of the household is a hundred-year-old countess who requires the blood of Spanish punk bands to retain her youth, and to help her get it, she employs a weirdly dubbed secretary. The castles live far from here? No, no, right there. It belongs to the Countess Flittermice. I'm her secretary, you know. And helping him are two weirdly dubbed voyeuristic cannibal dwarves and their weirdly dubbed carer. It is for you, sweetie. Uh, the kindness uh, and gentleness which you reserve for me at night deserves the reward. <laughs> I'm not a Franco fan, and it's all very Franco, with a typically nasty, sleazy edge to the exploitation and a lot of repetition, though that can be funny in itself. There are two characters who do nothing but have sex in a van, and we hear the same song around a dozen times, including twice on one journey, which is a journey from the gig where they just played the song, and to the spooky castle where they listen to it again. Whether that's a good thing or not, the English dubs the real gift, and it just keeps giving. She was honoured with the title, the services rendered, to the crown. Beautiful lobes, pendants. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> oh man, it's noon. How long have we been here? What time is it? When it comes to genre credentials, some of these entries are unavoidably dubious. But if anything meets the criteria of a movie made by heavy metal horror people for heavy metal horror people, it's this. falling from the sky. Death Metal Zombies is a mid-90s time capsule in which teen metalhead Brad Masters enters a radio competition to win the latest cassette from favourite band Living Corpse, and unfortunately for his friends... Yes! I won! Yes! Yes! Brad, if you're listening, we're mailing your prize tomorrow, the new Living Corpse cassette, with a new track that only you will own. That's right, you will be the only person to own this baby. You'd think kids like this would have seen enough of these movies to know that song will be cursed, but apparently not. And soon after moshing out to it, they start turning into brain-hungry zombies, which means the movie has to introduce some incidental victims. Which goes well. Yo, man, why you gotta keep talking about her? I just can't get her out of my mind. I, I, I can't believe she left me. You just don't leave somebody after five years like that. There's another man. I know there is. Relax, man. Man, I, I just feel like killing somebody. Writer, director, and semi-professional skateboarder Todd Jason Cook spawned a bunch of these lo-fi genre crudities in the 90s, and they tend not to do story. But they do define zero-budget shot-on-video enthusiasm better than perhaps any body of work I've come across. And Death Metal Zombies represents its pinnacle. Oh, no. Surprisingly watchable, considering the abysmal concept. 
writing, cinematography, continuity, editing, location, stunt, sound recording, art direction, special effects, makeup effects, and acting. Stay the hell away, pal! Or I'll play country music till your ears bleed! It remains entertaining largely because the music's authentic, the runtime's limited, and the characters are so likeable. It's like hanging out with a bunch of particularly nice kids who've been left home alone and stayed up way past their bedtime on a sugar binge. Everyone's just so happy to be a teen metalhead and you can't help but pick up on the vibe. Angel, man, I've just had the coolest dream. I was on stage with the Living Corpse. Really? Yeah, man. Johnny was playing drums, Tony was on guitar, Kathy and I were thrashing around. Man, it was great. Cool. A few honourable mentions to get to before we crack the top three, and as I said in the intro, I'm not interested in quality cinema here, only entertaining trash, and I've never been quite sure which category Hacko Lantern belongs to, or whether there's enough music for it to count here. Either way, it deserves a mention because it's a lot of fun thanks to High Pile as a mad grandpa who runs a satanic pumpkin cult. You have intruded upon the ceremony of blood, and now you must pay the price for your sacrilege. Other worthwhile curiosities with only a fleeting metal association include the wildly incoherent Slaughterhouse Rock and the thoroughly marvellous Auntie Lee's Meat Pies, which could be John Waters' take on the commercial-grade cannibalism of Sweeney Todd. Hey, I wonder what happened to this little piggy. <laughs> <laughs> Don't play with the food. Monster Dog stars Alice Cooper, but he's dubbed, and the movie only features one song, which dates from his pop rock phase. But it's written and directed by the team behind Troll 2, so at least there's plenty of shonky horror and shonkier dialogue. Listen, werewolves do exist. Oh, bull**t, Vince. The year 2000 is just around the corner. I am a recognized expert in electronic videos, and you are the hottest rock and roll star in the world. You're making records, videos, movies, on high-tech electronic equipment of fantastic sophistication. You can get on a plane tonight and be in Australia tomorrow. And you're scared of werewolves. Sweden's Bloderans, less compromising, with its all-girl punk band getting chased about a forest by an escaped mental patient, and at times it can be a delight. Given the country's long association with the music, it's also interesting to see an authentic, indigenous example of the genre, Blood Tracks being a dubbed Americanization. But it's just too boring. An accusation that can't be leveled at Jess Franco's Killer Barbies sequel, although it will make your eyes bleed and your head hurt. Just one last question. Oh. Why are you such a b I had an awful childhood. <laughs> Rocktober Blood's popular with aficionados, but beyond perpetuating some amusing genre stereotypes, I doubt it'll ever be clear why so many of these movies involve aerobics. It's really quite dull. The most entertaining bit's the message tagged on the end in which director Beverly Sebastian's husband updates us on her post-movie career. What has Beverly been doing for the past 25 years? She's been rescuing greyhounds. I can't mention all these things, but there's something to like in most of them. For some reason, this is a fairly reliably good-bad subgenre. Maybe it's because it often attracts filmmakers with a genuine passion for metal and horror. But even plot-dodging modern takes can be thoroughly enjoyable. Hello. Hello, Dave. Lionel! We all have writer's block, you know? <laughs> but that's my song. That's my song. You understand what I'm saying? And so to the top three, two of which I imagine seasoned fans will have guessed already, and one of which is criminally underrated. Looking in the shadows, dimness of night, plotting evil strategies, making wrong out of right. Hard Rock Nightmare begins with a flashback to a crazy old man having fun scaring the bejesus out of his grandson, who overreacts and stakes him right in the hammock. <laughs> Fast forward to the present, and little boy Jim's now the leader of a band that rocks so hard the police have to shut them down. So they decamp to the now deserted scene of the hammocking, and on the journey there we learn what sort of people we'll be dealing with in the least hard rock scene in any horror movie ever made. Hey you guys, I have to tell you all something, but I wanted to wait until Jim was asleep. What is it? This house has some bad memories for Jim. 
so if we could all be extra careful about Jim's feelings when we get to the house. This is what it was like on the Black Sabbath tour bus. Let's make the next few days as fun as possible so Jim won't have any bad memories, okay? Sure, yeah. no problem. After a long drive and a day trekking through a forest, they finally arrive at the remote farmhouse where mysterious things begin happening to the band members. First, they discover their instruments have beaten them there. Then the groupies won't sleep with them, and eventually sound engineer Tim falls victim to a farm thing. Only Jim has another theory. Tim's death wasn't an accident. A wolf did it. A werewolf. Okay, I was expecting Ghost Grandfather. In fact, we've already seen Ghost Grandfather. A werewolf seems a bit left field, but let's see where he's going with it. And it was my grandfather. He is the creature. Is your grandfather dead? Yes. But it's very hard to kill a vampire. After that, the movie could have done anything and I'd have stayed on board. But there's no need to worry. Writer-director Dominic Brassier proves to be enthusiastic, inventive, and blessed with an incredible ear for dialogue. Not that the editor always agrees. It can't be! There is no such things as vampires in werewolves! Despite that, it's not badly made, considering the budget. Most movies this cheap look like they were shot by a teen running his parents' camcorder through the usual routine of crash zooms and Dutch angles. But this could pass for a real movie when nobody's talking. It's at its best when they are, though, because most of the appeal lies in the characters, especially these two. My uncle told me that he saw a flying saucer once. Really? Yeah. Did he report it to the government? Uh, yeah, but they didn't believe him. Why not? And extra especially, the guy. Any luck, Sam? I don't know, maybe if I get her drunk enough. Not with her, with the phone. Oh, no, it's, it's broken. Shit. Filmmaker John Fasano was a bit of a cinematic polymath, working at different points in his career as a Z movie poster designer, B movie actor, and A movie script doctor. But he's probably best known as the director of enchanting late 80s rock horror confusion Black Roses. <laughs> Like a lot of these movies, it's about repressed middle-aged rustics trying to prevent a satanic rock band indoctrinating their teenagers. It's part boilerplate procedural, part exercise and stylish madness, both inadvertently funny and genuinely effective, clever and stupid. Only two kinds of men wear earrings. Pirates and f I don't see no ship on our driveway. Ultimately, there's more than enough craziness for Black Roses to feature here in its own right, but it isn't the Fasano fiasco I'm going with for this list, because a year earlier he made Rock and Roll Nightmare. Shot in seven days for just $52,000, The Edge of Hell, as it was originally titled, is the tale of rock band Triton, who shack up in a Canadian farmstead to record a new album. Why Canada? Because Toronto's where it's happening, man. But instead, wind up fending off vomiting penis demons. <laughs> There's a deadly slow build-up, which is partly by design and partly down to Fasano adding endless home video footage of a van because the movie was running short. That lack of pace is exacerbated by a lack of plot, with band members being haphazardly possessed by a variety of demons as they go about their business, which involves rocking out and having sex. Well, I'll be right back. I'm just gonna go shake the monkey, eh? That's the first hour, but once the band's all out of the picture and frontman John Triton finds himself the last man standing, Fasano finally turns everything up to 11 and blows the speakers on the spot. It transpires John Triton's really an archangel who's devised a plan to bring Beelzebub himself out into the open and engage him in a final battle over the soul of mankind. And naturally, that final battle looks like this. This is the heart of the movie, what David Lynch would call the eye of the duck scene. The eye of the duck, that's the eye of the duck, yes, yeah. yes. And it's fabulous. Once transformed into leather undied alter ego, the intercessor, John Triton reveals his ability to awkwardly grapple with Satan and dispatch him with a firework. Are you in this time? This place is yours. See you again, old scratch. 
All this was a vehicle for Canadian bodybuilder, glam rocker and period appropriate homoerotic poster poodle John Mickle Thor, who also wrote and produced as part of an effort to break into movies. You can see what he and Fasano were aiming for and as a 30 minute segment of a portmanteau it might have worked, though probably not. It is almost no fun to kill one so stupid as to not know who it is that slays him. Sadly, Thor's acting career didn't really take off, but he did return to the role that didn't make his name in a part animated sequel. And wow. Crack! The intercessor forces his scepter into the face of Zompira. Now be gone from this mortal world once and for all. Damn you, Triton! I will never release my grip on your beloved mortal world! I shall make my final sacrifice, and then you as well as that blasted Mephisto will bow to me. Heroic bands of rock horror tend to battle fairly predictable antagonists, usually a demon if they're supernatural or a rural psychopath if they're not. Writer-director Krishna Shah considered both options for his movie but decided what it needed was zombies, a werewolf with a flick knife, and Hitler. Schweine brains! Long enough I'm hiding a mask! Can it really be you? You think I shot myself down in some, some bunker someplace? You think that I am stupid? Very mind Führer! Today, California! Tomorrow, the world's in hell! Hard Rock Zombies begins typically enough, for a heavy metal horror movie anyway, when a rock band's arrival in a small town causes a brouhaha among the uptight locals. My National Enquirer says that musicians cannot play a single note unless they eat drugs first. <laughs> what? But it isn't long before we diverge from any known formula when the band members are all killed by Nazis, only to be resurrected as zombies and return the favour by killing the Nazis, who are themselves resurrected as zombies and start killing everyone else, or at least stumble about trying to stay on their feet long enough to kill everyone else. All this leads to an enormous zombie blamange of a last act and a moral dilemma for the band, who've since become bored and returned to the grave. Jesse, I've got the ring you gave to Cassie. They've got her, Jess. They're gonna tie her, tie her up and, and then let all the ghouls screw her to death. Is that what you want? Ghouls you created screwing her to death? It all begins to make sense when you realise Shah was a stalwart of the Indian film industry. His movie might have been made in the US, but with all the non-diegetic dancing, it works more like a Bollywood production, which is fine by me. I said, it don't come easy. And if it does, it tends to fade. You gotta try. Originally intended to be no more than the movie within a movie in Shah's sex comedy American Drive-In, the filmmaker convinced Cannon to fund its expansion to feature length, which seems to have been achieved via the addition of everything except plot. Plenty of things happen, but they're only tangentially related and can be hard to contextualise. For example, Ava Braun's a werewolf, but why? I could tell you she has a sex scene with Hitler, and that it's interrupted by their voyeuristic cannibal dwarf grandchildren. House! House! Can't we watch, please? Watch your own grandpa and grandmama geschlecht of f***ing machen! But I couldn't tell you why she has a sex scene with Hitler that's interrupted by their voyeuristic cannibal dwarf grandchildren. So cute! We can say nine! <laughs> Alright, you can watch! But don't touch! Ah. To be honest, I'm just wondering how there can be two movies on this list featuring a pair of voyeuristic cannibal dwarves. Along with the plot, also missing in action are the characters. Then Silent Rage bass player EJ Curse is meant to be the lead, but he only has a few lines of dialogue and none of them explain why he looks like Freddie Mercury in a bad Brian May wig, or why he acts like the limp wristed hero of a 1960s beach party movie rather than a metalhead. Get out of town, you little pecker. Well, we can't do that, sir. We got a real big concert tomorrow. You got shit tomorrow, Sonny. It's hard to understand why Shah made Hard Rock Zombies. He'd previously worked in US TV, writing and directing for shows including The Man From U.N.C.L.E., The Six Million Dollar Man, and Ironside, all of which managed to spell his name correctly, which puts them one up on Hard Rock Zombies. 
He then turned to theatre, his civil rights-themed Spanono making him the first Indian playwright to see their work produced on Broadway. While in Bollywood he directed much lauded documentaries and in Hollywood award-winning social drama The River Niger with James Earl Jones and the electric Glyn Terman. Oh, God damn, oh, I ain't bad, I'm crazy, my how he ended up capping his career with a pair of ridiculous mid-80s exploitation movies is something he's unfortunately no longer around to explain. So that's my take on the 10 best worst heavy metal horror movies ever made. Bearing in mind each word in that description comes with a disclaimer. I'd like to offer some kind of conclusion, but instead I'm left with a number of mysteries. Have Iron Maiden made more money from posters than records? Why are there so many waterbeds in these things? And who thought it'd be a good idea to put Ozzy Osbourne in a movie? These evil people have just got to be stopped. Thanks for watching. Feel free to like, subscribe, or even Patreon, and here's an earworm for the rest of your day. You're the devil's son!